our quiet center day after day is disturbed with loud voices proclaiming that there is no God. These speakers produce a scientific proof and complex arguments to back up those statements. Oh God, the really sad thing is that vulnerable people listen and think these words and statements are true. In addition, in addition, evil has so successfully raised its head, believing itself to be invincible and supreme, that its self-confidence has almost destroyed people's hopes and dreams that we can envision a different and better world. Gracious wisdom, we come to you seeking your blessing and encouragement and the faith to cling to you as our rock and sturdy foundation in a weary world. Let us all say amen. amen. It doesn't appear on what occasion Psalm 14 was written or if it was written for any particular occasion. Some say David wrote it when Saul persecuted him, and others when Absalom rebelled against him. But those are just mere conjectures. We don't have any certainty where this song originated from. In all the songs from the third to this, except the eighth, David has been complaining of those who have hated and persecuted him insulted him and abused him. Now here he traces all those bitter strings to the fountain, the general corruption of nature and sees that not his enemies only, but all the children of men were corrupted. The message translation for the text says, God sticks his head out of heaven and looks around, looking for someone not stupid, one man. God expected just one God ready woman. And he comes up empty. A string of zeros. Useless. Unshepherded. Sheep taking turns pretending to be the shepherd. Don't they know anything, all these imposters? Don't they know they can't get away with this? Treating people like a fast food meal over which they're too busy to Night is coming for them, and nightmares, for God takes the side of the victims. Do you think you can mess with the dreams of the poor? So I'm going to give you the good news of this text at the beginning. The intent of Psalm 14 is to counter the temptation that we, humans, can manage the world better than God. It reminds us of the Old Testament Isaiah when God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways. It is an assertion that to go against God is to go against a way of life that cares for the vulnerable among us. And you know what? The other good news is it's okay to be upset about it. In a world where corruption is the norm, in a world of inequality and orchestrated suffering, it's all right to have a little anger. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. The world seems to laugh at even mock our faith. It can be upsetting. That's what I like about the songs that voice outrage and sorrow. It lets us know it's okay to be upset. I find it freeing that in our sacred text, the Bible, there are some people that really get ticked off. Lord, do you see this mess? Lord, why do the wicked prosper? Please do something. It lets me know that passion in and of itself is not a bad thing. It invites me to honest communication with the holy with all my questions and outrage. 
It lets me know that the Spirit of God is wide enough to hold me in my outrage and my disappointment. I really need that sometimes. When I was an undergrad at Illinois State University, I was part of the interdenominational youth choir. And one of the first songs that we learned was, the fool said in his heart, there is no God, there is no God. The fool said in his heart, there is no God. We assume that those words and the opening of this song is talking about an atheist. But this is the sour political incorrectness that labels those outside of Christianity as fools. It is the dangerous religious view that asserts that their lack of faith in God leads them to very immoral and misdirected lives. It's the dogma that claims all other spiritual seekers in the world are headed in the wrong direction. As my grandfather would say, in the world and in the way. <clears throat> this is the kind of thinking that labels Buddhists and Muslims and New Thought practitioners as fools. That interpretation is assumes that Psalm 14 is about the non-believers of the world. But what if Psalm 14 is speaking not about professing atheists, but practical atheists inside of the church? Notice that these fools say in their heart, there is no God. These are not people who are speaking about their not believing who make a verbal profession of unbelief, but they speak in their heart, in the silent places of their interior lives, their private thoughts. These are not people exploring the theory of the non-existence of God, but practical atheists who live as though there were no God. Christians in name, but pagans in practice. Surely, we know who these people are. People who had a church service with people bound and chained underneath their sanctuary and were blessed before they embarked upon the transatlantic slave trade. People who, in the name of God, tore native children from their parents and destroyed their culture, claiming an indigenous spirituality to be evil. People who, in the name of God, cast those whom other cultures identified as special spirit, two-spirit beings, into a living eternal, eternal hell by their doctrine and political policies. People who, in the name of God, believe God so ordained them to take over the planet. Killing in the name of God, colonizing in the name of God, jailing innocence in the name of God. I would assert that all these are and were people who claim to be agents of God, but who lived as though there were no God. Not really believing that God stands on the side of the oppressed. Not really believing that when you care for the least of us, you honor all that is holy. Could that be the real message of this text? Blasting those believers' wrongdoing. Scholar Robert Davidson, who served as a professor of Old Testament at the University of Glasgow, thinks so. He thinks this psalm is directed against those in Israel who thought they could live as though God were practically irrelevant. And he drew the wrong conclusions about the moral fabric of society. And because they were practically in their living godless, they had no more restraint. With God on the sidelines, they were free to oppress the poor and needy 
and to amass great wealth unjustly. If we adopt that interpretation of Psalm 14, the message becomes a warning to the church, not those outside the church, about the ways that we may embrace this practical atheism and its implications towards social justice. What? Do you mean this outrage, this foolishness could be directed to those in our churches? Do you mean this outrage could be directed to those with a view of God as being exclusive and punitive? Something to think about. Could the outrage of this text be directed at those who in their heart, while saying they believe in God out loud, but who in their heart still don't see their neighbors as themselves? Who in the secret places of their hearts don't really believe the lives of every person matters and are upset when people cry out from the particularities of their existence? Could the outrage of this text be directed at those who in their heart don't believe that God's creation is sacred and thus are free to pollute and destroy the earth? Who in their heart don't believe God really stands on the side of the oppressed, the incarcerated, the unemployed, the undereducated, the migrant, the immigrant, and in their hearts, in their private spaces of beings, really see them as lesser beings who in their heart don't believe standing for justice matters who in their heart don't really believe the righteous, the prayers of the righteous avail of much. Because they say in the silence of their hearts, there is no God. We should be upset at these hard-hearted people going against God. Don't they know anything? Don't they know that they can't get away with this? Treating people like a fast food meal over which they're too busy to play. The Reverend Alan Gray of Houston, Texas, in his blog, asked us to consider this. If we stopped here, we can very easily feel quite satisfied with ourselves. <laughs> if we're the we in the us versus them, then we're God's people the righteous, who can look forward to God's salvation. But if we compare the lesson today from a word from Jeremiah, we're in it for a shot because there the prophet rails not only against the others who don't get it, but against God's own people. Listen for the word of the Lord. Jeremiah 4 and 22, for my people are foolish. They do not know me. They are stupid children. They have no understanding. They are skilled in doing evil, but do not know how to do good. Well, wait a minute. If they are God's people, if we are God's people, we have to be the good guys. We have to be on the right side of things, doing the right things. But the prophet in the name of the Lord strips away the pretense of self-righteousness by pointing exactly at God's people as the ones who are doing wrong. It crumbles the whole pretense that the good guys are God's people and the bad guys are the sinners. For the truth is, it is we who have gone astray. And it's hard for us to admit that we might not be as good as we like to think we are. It's very difficult to admit that we could be among the ones who have gone astray. We, the professed believers, are the ones that might have done wrong, that might be saying these things in our hearts. 
that we could be among the ones who not, don't really seek God. The fool said in his heart, there is no God. But what happens when we take the risk of admitting that we might have gone astray? What? Oh Lord, what if we have it all wrong? What if we have our priorities out of order with the will of God? What if we are the ones saying in the privacy of our heart, there is no God, it really doesn't matter, nobody's going to know. I mean, we know how the world really works. What if we are the foolish ones? We might think that God is done with our foolishness. We might think it would be humiliation and shame for us to say that we're among those. But the fact is, when we admit this, at least to ourselves, we find it liberating, not humiliating. That's why we have confession each week as an important part of our worship. We are taking the first step towards a fresh start. We're admitting the times when we say in our heart while we profess one thing with our mouths. Eh, God really may not see me. God really doesn't care. That's why we have confession because every time we have confession, we're taking the first step towards a new start, towards a new chance. And God is waiting to receive us, waiting to heal us from our upsetness, from our war within ourselves, waiting to offer love to us. We just have to say in our hearts, like the words of the song says, God is a spirit we worship her and spirit and truth, and just like the wind that keeps blowing, we can't see her, but we feel her move. There is a God. There is a God. There is a fountain of blessing available to everyone. There is another way to live a good life. You don't have to trample other people. There is a force in the universe greater than evil. There is a ground of all being that bends towards justice. There is a bomb in Gilead. There is a God. So if you are ready to say in your heart, in the private place of your being, if you are ready to say God is, we invite you to join this community of believers, for the doors of this church are always open. And if you want to discuss being a member, joining this beloved family, please meet me and one of our members at the welcome table right inside the doors during coffee hour. And let us proclaim together, there is a God, loving God, almighty God. Amen.